Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I have something very special for you guys. This is the very first episode of a brand new series, How to Home Lab. And you guys have been asking for new home lab content for quite some time, so I'm happy to finally be able to have a chance to sit down and create this content for you. Now, I would have had this done, you know, quite a while ago, but I've actually been writing a book lately. In fact, I've just submitted the final chapter of the book this week, and now we're getting the book edited. The book is called Mastering Ubuntu Server, 3rd Edition, written by yours truly, and pre-orders are available right now, so definitely check that out at ubuntuserverbook.com. But enough about that. This video is all about Home Lab, specifically getting started. What do you need to buy? What are some considerations and tips? Things like that. And as we go through the series, we'll get deeper and deeper into Home Lab and talk more about the individual components and things that actually make up a Home Lab. But I wanted to dedicate this episode to getting started. But before we get into that, though, I want to take a moment to mention this video sponsor, Linode. Linode is a sponsor of my channel because I actually use their service. They are my cloud service provider, and they have been for quite some time. You could use their service to quickly and easily spin up your very own cloud Linux servers in minutes. And they have all kinds of distributions available, such as Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, and more. And they actually have, get this, Arch Linux as an available option when you create your Linode. That's awesome. Be sure to visit the URL that you see on the screen right now or give the link a click that's in the description below this video to receive $100, yes, $100 in credit towards your brand new Linode account so you can get started and create your very own Cloud Linux servers today. I really appreciate Linode's continued support of Learn Linux TV. It's an awesome platform and I highly recommend you check it out. Now back to Home Lab. So before we get started in talking about how to get started, we need to define what home lab actually means. What is a home lab? Now, it might be a little obvious. It's running your own servers in your home, essentially. It's also known as self-hosting, basically taking your infrastructure into your own hands. Now, in my experience, it's often the case that a lot of home labs often have some cloud servers thrown in as well, so I like to define home lab as taking your infrastructure into your own hands in the sense that you make the decisions as far as where your services and applications are hosted. Maybe all or some of them will be located in your home or maybe you'll have a few, you know, cloud servers, for example. Maybe you want to set up a cloud server for backup or something like that. But essentially with home lab, the majority of your infrastructure is, well, right here in your home and behind me right there is my home lab and you've seen that behind me in pretty much all of my videos lately it started out as its own little rack in a separate room in the house but i thought it you know look cool here in the studio behind me it's just awesome and you know i added a little bling as you can see there's some glowing fans and whatnot you can have a lot of fun with this stuff but it's a lot of fun to build your home lab and get it set up just the way you want it now, the type of hardware that you buy for your home lab, you know, it pretty much depends on what you want to do with it. A lot of people want to set up things like Nextcloud or maybe VMware, Proxmox, basically a virtualization solution, maybe a storage system like FreeNAS, for example, or maybe some individuals out there are studying for certifications and they want to basically get their hands on the actual hardware or software that they are trying to get a certification in. There's all kinds of reasons to do this. I think the most popular reason, in my opinion, is Plex. Basically taking your media collection and sharing it and making it available to, well, yourself, as well as friends and family. That's a big driving factor in Home Lab nowadays. Plex is very popular, and even I run it as well, so I like it. I think it's pretty cool. But regardless of what you want to run on your home lab, the first decision you have to make is, well, what to buy. And I was really eager to get started. So the moment some servers became available, I bought them without question. There's no shortage of servers on eBay that you could buy that are, you know, refurbished, used or off lease. 
And you could just buy a few servers, have them shipped right to your door, buy a rack, put it together, and well, you're all set. Now you have a home lab. But what I've learned is that you should take your time and consider exactly what you want to buy, what you want to achieve. Because you also have to take into consideration how loud the servers are. Some of them are louder than others, especially 1U servers. Those are louder than 2U servers, generally, in my experience. And also how power hungry they are as well. If you live in a part of the world where you know, energy costs a lot of money, then you really have to think about how much power the servers are going to use that you're thinking about buying. As for me, the servers that I bought used a ton of power and they were super loud. The servers behind me are relatively quiet. I built those by hand because I wanted to have the most control over my servers and they're pretty quiet, but the servers that I originally purchased for my home lab, there's no way that I would get them in this studio. And even if I did get them to be quiet, there are some bio settings, there are some fan mods and things like that. You know, this room would heat up pretty quickly with these uh, big Dell servers that I had in the past. So just keep that in mind. You want to take a look at power usage. You want to take a look at, you know, how loud they are, things like that. You want something that's cost effective. And I'll give you some considerations to think about. Now, personally, I'm a fan of the Dell PowerEdge servers. I like those quite a bit. Now, you want to be careful. Just because it's a PowerEdge server doesn't mean you should go out and buy it right now. The servers that I first purchased were loud and they were very power hungry. So I wouldn't have been able to have them in the studio behind me like I have the ones that are behind me right now. The ones I have now are servers that I've built. I chose the components myself. I do have videos on my channel where I did build those. Those were recorded in my old studio. But I just decided to do that because, you know, I thought that would be a fun project. But initially, the servers that I had when I first started, there's no way they would go in this room. But I do recommend Dell PowerEdge servers. I think they're really cool. And you can get power efficient Dell servers and you can get Dell servers that are quiet. Check out the reviews. And one thing that I recommend you do is Google the CPU that the server comes with. And by Googling the CPU, you'll be led to the Intel architecture site, which will give you all the specs for that CPU, as well as the total power draw, which is really important. Also, you know, reviews, like I mentioned. You could check the reviews to see how loud everyone thinks the servers might be. There are fan mods and different fans you could put in that might help you. Also, bio settings as well can help quiet them down. But just keep all of that in mind when you go to build your home lab. You also want to take a look at RAM. Registered memory is, you know, I argue that it's not as important as everyone makes it out to be, but it is pretty important, especially if you are creating a NAS, like FreeNAS, for example. You probably want registered RAM. That's a big deal in that case, but I'll leave that up to you. Now, one thing that's often overlooked when it comes to home lab is, well, laptops. I have two of them right here in front of me. And, you know, these are actually studio laptops, so I'm not trying to make those servers or anything like that. But um, I can't take credit for this. I can't remember the individual who mentioned this on a popular podcast, but it's true. Laptops make great starting servers because if you think about it, if the battery works, then you have a built-in UPS right then and there. You have a built-in KVM because you have a display, you have a keyboard and a mouse. So you can get some pretty decent uptime on a laptop depending on your memory requirements that actually might be perfect. And the power usage of a laptop is going to be lower than a Dell server. Now I pick on Dell a lot because, you know, I've used them quite a bit, but you know, other server manufacturers are fine too. What really matters though is what CPU they run and again, how energy efficient the servers are. But another thing that's overlooked is Raspberry Pi. A big pet peeve of mine is when people say that the Raspberry Pi platform is only for testing and it's not for serious use. That is totally bogus. I've been using Raspberry Pis in production for a very long time and they're super stable. In fact, right here in front of me, I have the Turing Pi board inside this case. I'll be creating a video on that in the future but that uses Raspberry Pi compute modules. And with Raspberry Pi, the power usage is minuscule compared to a server. So you'll definitely save money if the Raspberry Pi platform suits your needs. I definitely recommend you give that a consideration. On my channel already, 
I have videos for creating your very own Kubernetes cluster on Raspberry Pi, so if that's something that you're interested in, go ahead and check out those videos. Now what I'm going to do at this point in the video is I'm going to talk you guys through my home lab setup, let you guys know what I'm running in mine, and then in future videos we'll explore each of these concepts in greater detail. Again, this is just an introductory video. But let's take a look at my home lab and see what I'm running. So in my rack, I have an APC UPS there at the bottom. And that's a pretty standard thing. It's just a UPS. Basically, I just want to make sure that nothing powers off, you know, abruptly. And my studio is in the basement of my house. And there is a legitimate power issue here in the basement. Several times a week, the power does go out. So it's a great idea, especially in my case, to have a UPS. Now the power issues are actually due to a wiring issue in the house that needs to be fixed and will be fixed soon. But even without a power issue, you know, power outages, they do happen. And you definitely don't want to have your servers go down abruptly. You definitely want a UPS. One server above that is my Proxmox server. Proxmox is a very popular virtualization solution. It allows you to run virtual machines. This one has 128 gigabytes of RAM. So it definitely has a lot of horsepower. I have a video on my channel dedicated to this particular server where I actually went through the entire build process. So check out that video if you're curious. And the same goes for the server above it. That server is actually a FreeNAS server. And FreeNAS is a very popular storage solution. You could freely download it and run it on your own hardware. And it does take a little bit of horsepower to run FreeNAS. It's not the lightest NAS solution in the world. So you definitely want to have a decent amount of RAM if you were to run FreeNAS. But I really like FreeNAS quite a bit. And it's really important to me because that's where all of my footage goes for my YouTube channel. And my storage requirements have actually gone up ever since I started the process of upgrading the channel to 4K. So I'm really glad to have the FreeNAS server. It does do off-site backups, which are pretty cool. And it also handles SyncThing, which is a utility for syncing your computers. And I use SyncThing quite a bit. I have a video dedicated to SyncThing already if you want to check that out. But I do recommend SyncThing. It's really awesome if you want to keep all of your computers synchronized with one another. It's awesome. And above that, I have a Unify switch. I really do like Unify hardware for networking. I have their access points as well, and they work great. And then above the Unify switch, on the left-hand side as well as the right-hand side, I have a bunch of Raspberry Pis. They're all Raspberry Pi 4s. And like I mentioned earlier in the video, I really do think that Raspberry Pi is a great platform for home lab. And I'm drinking the Kool-Aid because here, there's actually two stacks of Raspberry Pis in a custom case. The case itself was purchased from Amazon, and I really like it. On the left-hand Raspberry Pi rack, I have several things like a utility server that runs Smoke Ping, which is great for network monitoring. It runs my Unify controller as well, which a Unify controller is required if you have Unify hardware. I have a dev server on there as well, and that's basically for software development. It's kind of like my central SSH slash tmux host that I use for that purpose. I have videos on tmux as well if you're interested in that. So essentially the left hand pi rack is my miscellaneous pi rack with several different things going on there. And then on the right hand side that pi rack is dedicated to being a Kubernetes cluster. And I use the same process to build that as I went over in my Ubuntu Raspberry Pi Kubernetes video. So check that one out if you're interested. But I haven't had a whole lot of time to deploy a lot of containers yet. I do plan on getting to that again. I just finished writing a book. But it's been running very, very well. And I can't say enough how much I love Raspberry Pis in production. Now in future episodes, I'm going to go over in greater detail some of the things that I'm running. And maybe I'll show you guys how to build certain things as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. I don't yet know how often these episodes are going to come out. 
It all depends on how much you like this. If you guys love this video and want me to do more like this one, but in greater detail for some of the things that I've mentioned, I'm happy to do that. So the more you click that like button, the more inclined I am to create future episodes. I think I'll create at least five no matter what, but after that, it's all up to you guys and how well received this series is. Either it's going to be an amazing success or a complete dumpster fire. I have no idea yet. So I hope you guys like it because I love talking about Home Lab and you guys have been asking. So finally, I have the chance to create this content and I'll be creating the second episode as soon as I can. But before that, let me know what in particular you would like to know about Home Lab because your ideas might help shape the direction that this series goes in because I want to make sure that you guys love this series and that it does or it contains everything that you would like it to because I do these videos for you guys and I hope you like it. So if you like this video, click that like button, share it to all your friends and family, and I'll get started on the second video as soon as I have a topic. It probably won't take too long. And when I get that video uploaded, I will see you then. Thanks for watching.